Today we're going to start with something special. That foundation of the American educational system, that inspiration for generations of impassioned students, that sine qua non of academia, the surprise quiz. I hope you've studied for this surprise quiz better than you've studied for all your other surprise quizzes. But this surprise quiz is special because it's for a higher purpose than your weekend grade. It's to introduce you and welcome you to our conference. It's a very short quiz. It's a one question quiz, um, very short answer, and the first Two of you at the top of the class will win a prize of either Vandana Shiva's book, Soil, Not Oil, or Judy Schwartz's book, Cows Save the Planet, and I'm sure Judy will be happy to autograph it for the lucky person at the end. So here is the surprise quiz, if I can figure out the technology, which always saves us, as we all know. This. This is the mecca of science. This is my front yard. And I did a little experiment. The ambient temperature on a spring day was 90 degrees Fahrenheit. All you centigraders will have to figure that out for yourself. And I took my high-tech kitchen thermometer, and measured temperatures. I measured the temperature on the asphalt, a sort of black body, and on the grass, and apologies to the lawns, I rent, I don't own, so I have no decision to make over the Kentucky bluegrass, which is just sitting there and doing nothing. And temperature under the bushes, and the quiz is this. And if you're a hydrologist, you, you're excluded from the contest. What is the difference on that 90 degree day in temperature between the asphalt and under the bushes? I, OK, wait, wait, one at a time. We've got to keep track of this so we know. Who gets the prize? 28 degrees. 10 degrees. You say 40? How bold. 18. 70. You took this quiz before, didn't you? All right, any more? 25. 52. 30. 65. 31. 31. Okay. 52. The, the difference, let's see, the 65 degree person is the closest, so you get your choice, cows or, or soil, not oil. Cows. All right. Come on up so we can all give you a round of applause. The difference in temperature, and Judy's right there. The difference in temperature is 60 degrees Fahrenheit between there and there. And you should all try that experiment because that 60 degrees represents water and cover. If we were to do this across the planet, what a cool place we would have once again. So I'll not oil the person who said 52, gentleman who said 52, all right. Um, Vandana is not here today, so you'll have to imagine her signature, but I'm sure she would graciously sign it for you. So, now you have an idea how we may cool the biosphere even in the presence of elevated greenhouse gases and begin to change the course of climate change. This is the fifth reversing global warming conference that we've had in this past year. Reversing global warming is not a phrase that was often uttered in the climate science world. And we started using it with a purpose. 
We wanted to instill the idea that we can do more than mitigate and adapt, that we can actually turn these disastrous climate consequences around. This has been our foray into conventional scientific heresy. Of course, I'm unable to say with certainty that we can turn this thing around to the degree that we need to. Global warming may come to pass even if we do a Manhattan Project type of effort at addressing it. People will say, what about the massive heat stored in the oceans? the still rising greenhouse gas concentrations, the ever accelerating positive feedback loops, known and unknown, we don't know. And particularly from the perspective of mainstream climate science, it doesn't look good. Yet this conference is a conference of possibilities, some of which we've barely imagined. Possibilities that have been quietly growing on six continents over decades, centuries, even millennia. And today we have speakers from five of those six continents. We have been drowned out by the noise and the haste of global economies, irrationally exuberant technologies, lethal conflicts of civilization, and more. These possibilities have been waiting in the wings for the curtain to rise and offer us hope. This weekend, we'll think of it as a rising curtain. For if we define global warming as a greenhouse gas problem, the show is over. We might as well go for a final fling, eat, drink, and be merry. Even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that stopping emissions is not enough to avert disaster. And that dreary opinion comes from circles which have chronically and dramatically underestimated how bad it was going to be. So what are we to think? Is this all that science has to offer? Is it any wonder that there's so much climate despair and denial? What are we to do? First and foremost, we have to think differently. And there are a lot of you here who are already doing that. As it turns out, the physical scientists who have dominated the the climate science since the 19th century have largely ignored biology. It simply wasn't their field of study. I don't mean this as a criticism because they've done extraordinary work in analyzing the physics and the chemistry, et cetera, of the climate. And from that perspective, others have also observed climate effects on biology. But we are only recently beginning to understand how biology impacts climate. And therein lies the key. This weekend, we are looking at the Earth as an unimaginably complex system through the lens of the water cycle. We are investigating the extraordinary power of the life force, the force that has literally built this blue-green earth out of gas, water, and rock, and of course, sunlight. There's nothing else like it in the known universe. And here we are. We modern humans are captivated by our stunning technologies, Yet none of those marvels of ingenuity can compare to the workings of even a single bacterium. When we contemplate life in its infinite variety, the unfathomably complex dances and rhythms of living systems, I think we will find that our attention to technology is misplaced. The natural world, not technical hubris, no matter how dazzling, is our only chance at survival. Perhaps when our artificial trees and space bait based mirrors have been through three and a half billion years of testing, then we can go with that. But in the meantime, I'll stick with photosynthesis. Thank you very much. Therefore, I propose that the key to thinking about the current global climate disruption is that it's not fundamentally a greenhouse gas problem. Certainly, elevated greenhouse gases are potentially lethal, possibly plunging us headlong into the sixth mass extinction. And surely, we should stop fossil fuel emissions immediately. But greenhouse gases aren't the root cause. They are a symptom. Addressing them as the problem has unfortunately led us away from fundamental solutions. This may sound strange after 30 years of exclusive focus on emissions reductions, but it's well past the time for us to strive to think differently and engage in a paradigm shift that will support life into the 21st century. A paradigm shift demands 
that we abandon long and dearly held beliefs and practices. Entire cultures have collapsed rather than see the handwriting on the paradigm wall. Over 50 years, Thomas Kuhn introduced the world to thinking about paradigms and their shifts, shaking the scientific world with his classic book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn also brought the concept of paradigms into common conversation. And Alan Savory, the genius behind holistic plant grazing, has observed from long and frustrating experience of his own that paradigms shift one funeral at a time. Today, with global warming, we don't have time for all of those funerals. Fortunately, this paradigm has so many wonderful offerings that we may jump on board with enthusiasm. Briefly stated, it's this. Global warming is a problem of loss of biodiversity and the rampant destruction and toxic pollution of rich and resilient habitats worldwide. Biodiversity is the living planet's insurance policy. It provides the resilience and adaptivity um, adaptability that has kept life going on Earth for billions of years. It is the expression of life's creativity and extraordinary tenacity. It is nature's package deal, offering abundant food, water, healthy local communities and economies, and an eventual solution to droughts, floods, resource wars, and pollution. Of course, we must do our part on many levels, but these are the possibilities, real ones, and we can get to work on them right now. In fact, we already are. Many of our speakers will tell you about it. We're doing it on millions of acres around the world. We need to grow those acres into the billions. We know a great deal about how to restore ecosystems and are learning more all the time. Nature responds to our participation in regeneration of habitats and biodiversity with remarkable rapidity. We see this in that most magical of substances, soils. Today's atmospheric excesses are originally from the soil and with little, with low or no tech help, we can put it all back and at very little cost. Do we know how much and how fast? We can only make educated guesses, but we're also at an early stage in this unfolding paradigm. And there is convincing evidence that conventional views of soils and climate have underestimated the potentials, quite likely by large margins. The science is growing rapidly, and we'll hear about some of that evidence at this conference. We worry a lot about numbers, and we wonder exactly how much carbon is sequestered by eco-restoration practices. But that may actually be a misleading question. Let's consider that pertinent questions are more like is the land getting healthier? Is the water cycle improving? Are local habitats regaining their health? Is species biodiversity returning? Are resource-driven conflicts abating? Is net primary production the effect of global photosynthesis on the rebound, thereby capturing gigatons of carbon and putting much of it back into the ground? I think that our real goal is to regenerate a thriving and biodiversity diverse planet for all, all species, and that lowering greenhouse gases is, is but one of the many positive effects that we can reasonably expect. Eco-restoration is our real mission, and our narrow focus on greenhouse gases has in fact been something of a distraction. Don't take my word for it. Listen to the wonderful people we have who will be addressing you this weekend, and you will also have an opportunity to give your own workshops on Sunday, we'll have lots of conversation about this. Most of our speakers will be with us for the whole weekend. Be skeptical, inquiring, but be as skeptical of the old paradigm as well as of the new one. Over the last few months, those of us working to put this forum together have been amazed and delighted at what we've discovered. We hope that you will find it as hopeful and inspiring as we have. And now for something completely different, we have author Judy Schwartz. Her, I just gave away the last copy of her groundbreaking book, Cows Save the Planet. They'll hastening to print a whole new edition any moment. Um, you wrote it, my god, it was, must be 40 years ago now? <laughs> oh, no, no, it wasn't. It was, my gosh, so much has happened since you wrote it. 2013, and Judy is the one who 
who is one of the inspirations for the, uh, our first conference last year. So without further ado.